actually at all. Uh, which took it over in 1994 to help the park and we produce commemorative and first day covers. That's one for the invention stamps a couple of years ago and we put Alan Turing and Tommy Flowers on the envelope. We did one a fortnight ago and you'll be going to the Tunny exhibition. We'll get to Tunny, Tunny Gallery. Yes. Yes, yeah. before you finish. We did one for them. And it's uh, selling very well, fortunately. <laughs> we also do a little thing which we call our secret. It's a bit of fun. It's got some sweet coupons on the back, but I don't think they'll accept them. <laughs> and then inside, there's, it tells you what rations you got there in the war. Two ounces of butter each, two ounces of cheese. One egg per person per week, so to get your eggs and bacon very often. You also get a registration card, and in there is a message which can be decoded on the online, online Enigma, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. You also get an envelope, you get a nice envelope, that's the Bletchley Park one, there's various ones in there, and we post them home to you for five pounds each to set. There's a recipe inside as well. And they all get Bletchley Park hand stamp on them. And we're still allowed to postmark their own mail. It's a machine. I think it was the SZ42. But the Lorenz was the firm that made it in Germany. Used only by Hitler and his high command, let's say. So very important messages. We needed to break into it. Um, you'll hear the story probably from somebody else when we get over there. But the first thing you'll see, we go into what's called the Tunny Room. This was the room that shows you, first of all, the sort of equipment that would have intercepted that message when it was sent. It was a teleprinter message, but of course, teleprinter messages can be sent by radio. When they're sent by radio, if you listen to the noise that it makes, it sounds a little bit like Morse, but much too fast for anybody to understand. Nobody could possibly listen to teleprinter traffic and take it down. We needed a machine to intercept it. We used an undulator, I think it was called for intercepting it and turning it into a wavy line. That wavy line was then read, in this case by ATS girls, it was read by them and translated into the letters that this wavy line represented. They, all they had to do though was to tap onto a teleprinter and they got the jumbled letter message out. Again, just jumbled letters that didn't mean anything. The machine that did it, this Lorentz machine, had 12 wheels all of which were almost independent of each other, different number of cogs and so on, a very difficult one to break into. Um, we needed to, to break into that, and again, in the early days it was done with paper and pencil, but we needed a machine to be able to find the starting position of those 12 wheels. That's what you needed to do with this particular machine, find the starting position of the 12 wheels. Um, once you could do that, then you could set up a Lorentz machine to those starting positions if you had one, but we didn't. Set it up, uh, use the teleprinter message, set, send the teleprinter message into that machine, and out would come the original, it worked backwards again. All, it, all the machine did was sort of add letters at random to the message that went in, so it came out jumbled at the end. So that was difficult, because we, nobody here ever saw one of these Lorentz machines during the war. Nobody had any idea what they looked like. But one particular thing happened, I'm not going to go into the details here, one particular thing happened that enabled them to do exactly that. It enabled them to work out what the machine worked like, the logic of the machine. Not what it looked like, but how it worked. And once they'd worked that, we could build our own machine that did the same job. So we built this machine which was called Tully. Which is why we're going to the Tully room now. We built the machine called Tully. Most of the, most of the naval messages were given fish fish names, naval codes, given fish names. So we called the machine a tunny, and it didn't have 12 wheels, but what it had was 12 strips instead. It's like the wheels were straightened out. And you could plug up these strips to indicate the starting position of the wheels. Fine. That was the machine, that was the Lorenz. But you had to find the starting position first. The Russians did not know about Colossus, and they did not know that we had actually managed to break the Lorenz code. They knew we'd broken uh, enigma at the end of the war, but at the end of the war they did not know that we'd broken this Lorenz code and we didn't want them to find out. So it was kept a secret, even at that stage, from just about everybody. It's one of the reasons why the secret was kept after the war. 
you will yeah. not to give away the fact that we've yeah. broken that particular one. Um, ten colossi were actually built altogether. Two more were being built that weren't needed because the war finished. Ten were built, but at the end of the war they were all destroyed along with all the other machines. Uh, they were destroyed or moved elsewhere. Two of them were actually moved down to northwest London uh, and East Coast, and then from there they went down to Cheltenham, GCHQ at Cheltenham. And they were used there, these two machines were used there until I think it was 19, 1961. We've got no idea what it looked like, but nevertheless, we could intercept the signal. 
because the signal sounded just like that. That was put on to undulator tape, which is that narrowish tape that's spewed out of this machine here called an undulator, uh, which is a, for a glorified pen recorder. Fairly well established te uh, telecrypted technology. The ATS girls at Knockholt in Kent <coughs> then sat and read that tape without understanding a single word. They understood the letters, they could form the letters here, it's a bit like reading shorthand. You could form the letters up, you were taught how to do it, <coughs> and you then typed it, it up on the keyboard here, which brought it out into a teleprinter format like that, teleprinter format, brought to this machine here, put on the machine, load it on there, press a button, and lo and behold, the message appears in BP. I'm now in Bletchley Park, believe it or not, M25 wasn't too bad today. Um, so here we are in Bletchley Park where the signal has arrived, which is still a lot, a lot better off because we've got no idea of what the machine has, that was doing the encrypting even looked like, let alone how it worked. Fortunately, two German operators, fortunately for us, around about 1942, two German operators made a ghastly mistake one in Athens and one in Vienna, sent a long message, some 4,000 characters long, at the end of the um, reception, uh, 4,000 character message, the receiving end, whichever end that was, I can never remember, doesn't really matter. But the receiving operator radioed back to his chum and said, sorry mate, didn't get that, send it all again. Wow. Not at all unusual in radio communications, it happens all the time, fading, uh, atmospheric, that sort of thing, quite normal in radio. Um, and what it should have done, I mean, it transpired, I'm jumping ahead of this a bit now, the machine that was encrypting was this machine here. What the sending operator should have done was to reset his wheels here, reset the machine to a different setting. So he never used the same setting twice. He was obviously feeling a bit bullshy, a bit fed up, and he radioed back to his mate and said, we'll go with what we've got. Uh, that in itself would not have been too bad if... Um, he had sent exactly the same message, letter by letter by letter by letter. But unfortunately he then made the next mistake for him, uh, gold for us, gold dust. He abbreviated certain words. And so the second message ended up as being a few uh, hundred, hundred characters shorter because of his abbreviation. Um, they analysed the two tapes and if you can imagine laying two tapes two separate uh, interceptions side by side and you could then see where the differences were. And they were able to work out some very, very brilliant uh, work by, by the name of Bill Tutt, um, who was a chemistry graduate from Cambridge, worked out that that was the block schematic of the machine. He'd never seen the machine, all he'd seen was that. And he worked out that that is how the machine was working. Based on that, the job was given to the post office. The post office engineering department were asked if they could make a machine that would do that. And they came up with this equipment here, which doesn't look much like the tiny equipment, much like the Lorenz equipment, but nevertheless, it does the same job. So that equipment there does the same job as that equipment. You still needed to know the wheel start position and the pattern that existed around the periphery of each of these 12 wheels. The pattern was worked out in the numerary using mathematical and linguistic techniques and that sort of thing. It gave you the pattern of your wheel settings here, bearing in mind that that could be different for every single message. And there was 800 messages a week. So you were, set, you were changing this every 800, 800 times a week. So each wheel had a start position, and that was found using another technique on Colossus. The Colossus gave you your wheel start position. That was laid up on there. If I switch on, yes, I have another. Zero, how you set your program up, you want zero to the And we then took a, an extract of that, a, a, um, a letter by letter by letter by letter. 
tight to be on your spiritual keyboard. And it came out on that paper roll there, the German decrypted message. Courtesy of the British Post Office. Turing in a conversation one day with Max and Newman, the head of section, so why don't you go back to the post office at Dollis Hill, have a word with a brilliant electronic engineer, Tommy Flowers, see if he can help. He did, and this is the solution that Tommy came up with. He said, well, with keyboard, we'll make the message they run as an endless loop. It's actually going around at about 30 miles an hour, at 5,000 characters a second in process. And the sound we can hear in the background tells us to take the thing down once, and again, in that short period of time, it's been completely unright, and the electronics is teasing out of it with information we're desperate for, the start position of the wheel upon the Lorentz machine. When it gets to the point where the electron just can't improve on its estimate, it will output that information here on the electric writer as a wheel number and a wheel start position. When the information for all 12 wheels has been output, the Wren, who's driving the system, will take the message tape, take that information, send it back through to the tummy, have it plugged in, message tape through, and we can get it from the teleprinter. The first machine went into service January 1944. It was so successful they needed the order to further 11. Only a further nine ever turned up, take the tens of sight, and number nine was installed here, where we're all standing now. As the year progressed, the design improved and we get to Colossus Mark II, which this is a rebuild. That went into service on June the 1st, 1944, just five days before D-Day. The beauty of that was analysis of the traffic between Hitler and his generals. It proved that uh, all those games we played of paper tanks and cardboard aeroplanes on the coast of Sussex Kent and Essex uh, had paid dividends. Hitler was convinced we were going to invade from Dover to Pas de Calais, and that Normandy was the diversion. The rest of the course is here.